At this time, we'd like to welcome Dr. Dorothy Balancio, Professor of Sociology and Director of the Sociology Program at Mercy College to the stage. I'm Dorothy Balancio from Mercy College. Welcome, guys. I am so thrilled to have you here at the college. Um, you will be meeting over the next two days some of our fantastic students. Um, we think they are the best on the planet. But they are very, the ones that you're going to meet are the ones that are extraordinarily interested in these topics. Plus, they are, the college is going to support them for doing semesters abroad. I would love for them to go to some of your countries and do a semester there. Um, internships, I mean, we would love to open up their lives to dreams of things they maybe they didn't think about at all. So uh, welcome. We're hoping that this is going to be a, going to be a collaboration with the with with essentially the International Center for Ethno Religious um, Mediation, IMCR, and Mercy College. Um, I also have a private foundation. I'm a homicide survivor. My 21 year old was murdered in a hate crime, so I am very passionate uh, about these topics. So welcome. Uh, you're welcomed here with a lot of love and a lot of spirit. And my fellow sociologist, um, I am introducing right now, I'm thrilled because we're both sociologists. And one thing you should know about us is the fact that sociology, more than any other discipline on the planet, we call, I call it a mutt. We are basically, uh, the more I study and read in this subject and teach, there's no other intellectual work that overlaps with so many other areas. Um, and my colleague to this morning, or now it's this afternoon, um, is going to give you some of her wonderful work. Um, and the thing that is, that is brilliant about her work is the fact that she's touched upon so many different um, pieces of research that has been done. Um, and one of the things about what she's going to be presenting to you is the fact that these particular professional uh, peer review journals publish this stuff. And when they publish something, they're kind of putting their imprimatur on it. And now that becomes part of a discussion. When the biggest problem we have is apathy and the fact that we are not noticed. I mean, we're not even low class if we don't get discussed. We're not classed at all. So she's going to be showing you and talking about some really distinguished areas. And if you look at her background, not only is her, her so, she's a sociologist, but she's also in social work and gerontology, and she directs those programs at St. Mary's College at Notre Dame, uh, Indiana. Her name is Frances Bernard Common Cavus. Um, please welcome her. I, I don't want to start the drop the mic right now. All right, we're, we're going to wait for that, colleagues. What I do want to start with, and I appreciate that, be that beautiful introduction, Dorothy, to say the least, I really do. And part of that reason is, is that I have, for at least the first two decades of, of my existence, was a practicing social worker. I had a BSW and an MSW, first baccalaureate social work program ever in the state of Indiana that went that far. Again, got the first BSW from that state and then went on to get an MSW, also in first advanced standing group to get the master's degree in social work. I decided to go out and lay my healing hands, if you will, knowing that I had some background, of course, in being able to work with individuals who were going through conflict, who were trying to resolve issues, who were looking for peace building. And doing that more, what I would consider to, to talk with all of you about, more on an individual or family basis. And then start working with the community. 
and then start working with organizations when I think we as social workers and others in this room totally understand that the importance of going with the macro section is very important to us as well. That unless we look at policy changes, it's going to be very difficult for us to affect any changes even in peace building unless we look at those issues. So then I went back and decided I would, I really like school, by the way, can you tell? And so I went back and uh, my husband said, you probably need to get a degree in business to balance that social work very well. And so I went ahead, went to Notre Dame, Mendoza School of Business, and have a, a master's degree in management, and in, in actually administration from that college, from the university, and was very uh, proud to get that. I used that then to keep going into administration in social work, and ended up going into academia because at that particular time, and I, I think a lot of us were breaking glass ceilings, as I talk with my students now, and I am in an all-women's institution. So we are all about empowerment. And looking at that empowerment in particular, it's working with our students that there are a lot of glass ceilings that have been broken, but there are many more to go. So I started out this research, Dorothy, and you'll find this very interesting, because statistically, we're looking at many major peace accords that were starting to be uh, seen as successful, longer lasting, that were also started by women, where women had some kind of place at the table when looking at these peace agreements. So that led me into an area of maybe I would like, as when Basil had the wonderful idea about the theme for this conference, I said I'd really like to start looking at women, peace agreements, peace accords, and their place at the table, the success of those peace accords, and then started to do as all of us would do in this room, an excellent literature review. And then I realized by beginning that literature review that in essence, I didn't really have the best operationalization of any of the terms. Ethno-religious conflict, it was very difficult for even peer-reviewed journal articles to agree on exactly what those definitions were going to be. And as we know in this room as well, if we don't start off on the same page, it's going to be very difficult for us to conduct that research and for me to get up here and tell you we're using that same terminology. So our last question that we had, I complimented your last question in particular, because we do have to really start looking at what are some of the areas of religion and what is defined as religion. And so when we talk about ethno-religious conflict, we have to understand that definition. It's, I'm still a teacher, colleagues, so forgive me. I became, I think because I'm probably have the, I really like to be in administration, but I really love social work, and the two are a great combination. Sociology gives me that wonderful balance. But let me ask you this. When you have to operationalize and get to the same definition to start out with, when you're starting to do research so that you can generalize your research and for others to pick up that research, read that research, and totally understand that they can then use that research in their own situation. How do we colleagues start to come to that conclusion? So I asked other colleagues within my institution and others outside of my institution as well. I was fortunate enough to be at the Kroc Institute at the University of Notre Dame this summer for their Faculty Institute on Peace Studies. That was very helpful. I tried to get some definitions down as well as I could use here. And really came up with, repeatedly, colleagues were saying, you've got to use the Oxford English Dictionary. You know, that's a really good place to start. And overwhelmingly, we still have that in our genre in terms of looking at what, how we're gonna operationalize this. Because again, it was really difficult, if nigh impossible, to locate an article that defined every one of those I could use then in assessing the next article and making comparisons and doing a content analysis. So colleagues, that's where I'm starting with today. In terms of, I'm a little bit of a reporter today because I'm reporting on all the wonderful work that our colleagues have done before. Um, one of those, actually, that I'm reviewing today is, is uh, Basil's work 
as well in, in his work, of course, on peace. But what I wanted to start with you again is that going into this area, we may at, be at different places in our definitions. What I'm going to ask of you in the few minutes I think we're going to have for discussion, because I would love to open this up for discussion, Dorothy, as well, is for us to talk about some of those issues, even in terms of researching this area well. And how I define well is that we can at least learn to generalize it and use it in other areas for discussions as, uh, as I guess, even ways that we can start other types of research in the area of peace and conflict resolution. So today I want to bring that as part of our challenge in our discussion that we have together and have it be, of course, Caligo and lo us looking at some of those other areas. So I wanted to, uh, again, start I, I didn't, I was Dr. Grimm, I wasn't going to tell anything about my family, but it's always fun, all right? Because most of the time, uh, and my husband will giggle at this, most of the time when I'm at St. Mary's, most of the individuals were, will think that I'm a sister of the Holy Cross, all right? And I take that as a great compliment, but I always tell them, no, I'm, I'm not, unfortunately, but I'm lucky enough to be at this wonderful institution. I have two children. One of those children, uh, again, became a, a lawyer after she became a master's degree in social worker because of the fact that she was looking at the macro policies that we look at as well. Um, my, she's now a practicing attorney in San Diego. She's actually now, right now at this moment, in Israel. My son is... A, a, a scholar who started out at the University of Notre Dame, graduated from there, of course, but started out with German as his major, and then they called him into the office, the dean's office, and said, you're going to have to choose another major. I thought, okay, what happened? Right. But what he ended up doing was he passed out of the first two to three years of German at that institution, and they asked him to choose a, an additional major because he was going to get advanced standing credits and he, could, he needed to graduate with a specific amount from the University of Notre Dame. So I thought he would pick philosophy, English. He says, I want to learn Mandarin. So he had, was the first student at Notre Dame, actually, to go to both, the, both of the broad experiences that they had at the time in, in Shanghai and Beijing. And he has taught me, and my daughter has as well, I feel that I have, it's not that I have raised them in this way. I feel that they, we have walked this together and they have raised me because I became much more global over the years, even in my research, have been able to go to China, um, have been able to go and do research on multiple occasions in Germany as well, because a lot of my background is child welfare, and that area in particular, uh, since the, the issue of, of course, what happened during World War II, here in the United States, we all know that we talk about looking at families being what I consider reunified in that sense. We have family preservation as our major social policy issue when we take a child out of the home and want that re resolution of conflict within the home before that child can be removed. In Germany, it's very hard to even remove a child from the home. It's, as a social worker, as a practicing social worker, I could make a phone call to the state of Indiana, Child Protection Services, and not all of the time, but they would trust my judgment, go make a phone, go make a visit to the home, and that child would be possibly removed from the home until an investigation was done. In Germany, it's a very different situation in terms of looking at that conflict resolution. It's usually a clinical social worker or a psychologist or a psychiatrist that has to make that referral before that child is removed. So it's, again, colleagues, what I have found over the years, we all have different definitions of what different areas are in policy. And again, some of those differences really sit at the level of how we're going to research these important terms that we're discussing today. So looking at our next area here in terms of conflict, um, Gadar saw it again as we have up here in the slide. All my slides will be available to you colleagues at lunch. I have a pack of business cards. If you want one, I'll go ahead and send you the, the PowerPoint to it. No, no issue with that whatsoever. Conflict is a shaping force in the global economy. So when we start looking at how we're going to start defining this, that has come up as one of the definitions used across the board. The important attributes when we start to look at some of the third world attributes, in particular when defining conflicts, is looking at ethnic or religious conflicts. 
So I sometimes went through the back door on this, colleagues, if you will, and I would find some definitions by looking at other areas. So when I started the research, I only looked at peer-reviewed journals, and that's where I basically stayed for the, uh, the paper that I gave to this program. Now I'm going to continue that into the gray literature. Does anybody know what the gray literature is? How we define the gray literature? It's more of that literature that's found to be on websites. It could be presentations that have not been published yet. Sometimes it's defined in that way as well. Sometimes it's defined too as, uh, again, not just conference, conferences proceedings that have not yet been published, but gray literature could also be possibly what's on the internet. And sometimes we all have to work with our students and yourselves on how much we can take from there if it's not peer reviewed. But I was finding that maybe that would be another good place for us to start analyzing some of this as well, because there's some excellent ideas that can come from those sources. So as we look at, going back one, as we look at the physical and capital production, and I really have to go back to uh, Basil's research, which we're going to talk about in a little while here as well. His research really does talk about looking at all the environmental factors in terms of seeing if there's an economic cost. And so some of us who work with theory very much know that we have to have theory to be able to know what our path is in a particular project or particular area. If we don't have theory, we may not have a clear understanding of what we're trying to do and where we're trying to go with this practice. So when I looked at theory, systems theory came to mind quite a bit, even the ecological approach. And I saw systems theory so much in Basil's work in terms of looking at all the factors involved, not just factors about how much the country was spending in terms of a conflict or a war. But all those other factors like what has happened to the individuals in that country, what has been the cost to them of rehabilitation, physically, emotionally, PTSD, all of these other areas. So there was so much literature that talked about specific areas, but very difficult to find literature that covered all of these areas. So that's why when Dorothy is talking about future research for all of us, for, for her students in particular, but looking at this, colleagues, as I hope that there's going to be a conversation with us after this session and during the time that, that we are here to start talking about where we can go with this research. I think what Basil has done is really set the first frontier for us in helping us get started with this. Again, without understanding what the effects of conflict are, the economic effects, it's very hard to come to the table when you're talking about peace building in that sense. So Shane, who did this wonderful 2017 article as well, was very helpful with this, talked quite a lot about that changes in the economic environment, again, using that whole, all the environmental factors, not just the economy per se, but all those other environmental factors that can affect the economy. So Shane was talking about that any changes in that environment caused by the conflict can also have economic impact uh, on that country's development. And that does, I think, come to us in a way that we, if we start our research in such a way that we're bringing in all of these areas. Uh, again, Hamber and Gallagher did a research study that talked about the effects of the Northern Ireland conflicts and what was happening there and what happened with the young men in that area and found that there was a, just a much greater incidence of suicidology, suicide attempts, looking at areas such as depression and anxiety and also fear of paramilitary, fear of other areas that also affected sometimes the, their decisions about going on with their education. So that sets up a whole other area about economic environmental issues, if an individual decides not to go on to continue to be educated in their country for fear of being hurt at school or being hurt in a similar environment, it's going to be, have an impact economically on that country as well. So this, these are some of the findings that I was learning throughout these studies as well. I looked at 59 databases 
These were online scholarly databases. My library loves me because I think I hold the record in asking for full text articles from them. And, and so at one time, I think they put in an extra person to help me out over there in the library because it was stunning, actually. And so I literally went into a few hundred articles to begin with to try to find that commonality. I feel like I was always um, thinking of Basil, what he was trying to do for all of us to come to that table and talk about these issues. So I wanted to do the best job I could possibly do. And that meant a very thorough research re of the literature. So winning or losing a conflict, uh, according to Shane's research, it's not, he's put that it's not always accurate that winning a conflict can result in positive changes in the economic environment and losing a conflict results in negative effects on the economic environment. So my first reaction was, what? <laughs> and so we went on to discuss that in this, this, this presentation as well, especially Shane's research focuses quite a lot on Israel. So I think some of you are familiar with this research as well. So a conflict can be won, but if the conflict caused negative effects on the economy, the economy or the economic environment, all those factors we were describing, the economy may also be harmed. And some of this uh, did not come up till much later. Some of the research on the difficulties in the Gaza conflict, we started looking at these early on in the Gaza conflict research. We saw the first year, colleagues, as usually what would happen in the first year of a conflict. We had uh, deaths. We had issues that we, with which we were dealing. We had re rehabilitation to have to deal with in terms of the cost of that, physical rehabilitation, uh, and also looking at some of the uh, occupational rehabilitation as well. But in that second year, and sometimes that's why we have to continue to study the economic effects to know what, what effect this is going to have on the economy, into that second year, this study found that in particular that we were looking very much more at some of the more mental health issues or the long time rehabilitation care, the long term care that that was going to take. So it, has, it can't be stopped. I was learning that from the research literature. We can't just say it's a certain amount that the country had to pay for, for those individuals who went to war. It's not only uh, how important that this is, but it's not only the deaths in the country, it's all those other repercussions that came about because of that as well. And continuing to study that on down the line as well, more long term. So the analysis of existing salary, I talked a little bit about this, so I'll go on, but OED, in my paper, I think I have five pages on this like how I was able to come to the conclusion of what, it, of what the best definition is. And, and I'll leave that for another conversation with you colleagues, maybe at lunch, because we probably don't have enough time to do that right now. But I did look, use many Boolean search terms and put those together. I think one of my most interesting combinations was when I used economic instead of economy. What do you think, colleagues, was a, di was a difference when I was looking up economic as one of the Boolean search terms instead of economy? What do you think might be the difference with that? When I said, when I put in economy and conflict or economic and conflict, what do you think came up, colleagues, with that? Just guessing. I heard some good, heard some good. All right, hear, I hear rumblings, all right. Absolutely, dollars definitely were, were a major area of this. And, even, and looking at that economy, it was much more dollar driven. It was much more of that macro environment, if you will, of the whole economy. But when I put in the search term inserted economic, I was coming up with even different articles that went to some of these other areas that were more individualized. What was the cost in particular individuals? So it was fascinating even to use a different permutations of the bullion search terms. Come on, you guys, you love this too, don't you? Just changing the search terms a little bit. So when we looked at the methodology then, I tried to keep changing those terms to try to get the most articles I possibly could to bring to you today too. For some of you, and again, uh, this is a very, you're very knowledgeable about this, and this is, uh, again, repetitive for many of you, but looking at our research in particular, 
Some of Nigeria and Cameroon, for example, uh, before the Boko Haram conflict, Nigeria is one of the African countries with an extremely high amount of religious conflicts, according to our researcher. And looking at the different areas, I looked at four different countries, in particular, four different regions in particular. I had to stop because the paper, I think, was close to 27 pages at that point and had to move on to another, uh, another way of at least bringing this to you. So I'm going to go on and talk a little bit. All right. And it will work because we're going to will it to work. There it is. Ah, I either went to the end of it or not. All right, and thank goodness, I could do this without it, colleagues. I don't have a problem. Oh, it's coming back up. Oh, let's start, let's start at Basil's quote, which I think is perfect, actually. We're fine, we're fine, colleagues. You don't even have to go get anyone. We're perfectly fine. In terms of the Boko Haram terrorism in Nigeria, for example, and looking at this quote, which absolutely, I think, was an inspiration to me because it called to my sense of, we have to do more than just looking at statistics. We have to delve further into this. And so, again, what this quote is saying to me, again, is it led to, we know that the Boko Haram terrorism in Nigeria led to the death of thousands of people, including Muslims and Christians, and the destruction of property, infrastructure, and developmental projects. And as Basil went on to say, it threatened national security, uh, causes human disaster, psychological trauma, disruption of school activities, unemployment, and an increase in poverty, resulting in a weak economy. And uh, again, we had our first two speakers today, and Basil with his opening remarks. I think we can see a lot of the commonalities in this as well. Between our three speakers, later, I think a very good path for where I am right now. So in, in looking at this, and I'm not shutting it off, I'm just, just having fun with me today. The, the Iran, Iraq, and Turkey, Syria situation as well, when we looked at how much the cost of that was, because I did believe I needed to bring some of those statistics to you as well as what I was finding in the literature, and this, we read it, we want this read really as $1 trillion, $97 billion. This was the cost of the Iran, Iraq war from 80 to 88. It had economic total cost. It was read as, again, $1,097 billion. But when you translate that, it's read as $1 trillion and $97 billion. So it's, it's numbers that are almost unheard of. But again, looking at that, it was hard to discover from that article, in particular, colleagues, if all of the other factors were taken into consideration. Like, like Basil talked about in his research, like others have been discussing in their research too, like the Hamber and Gallagher article, looking at all those other costs to society too. Um, after Iran, Iraq had, of course, the, the largest Shiite population that comprised 60 to 75 percent of the Iraqis. So we're looking at the conflict, again, as an ethno-religious conflict, as we would even define that. So we're, we're going to go through a few of these slides. Again, I'm going to give you all these. You're absolutely welcome to them. Um, we, a lot of us understand the issues with ISIS, too, and taking control of the areas as well. The, when we look at areas beyond Syria, advanced into Iraq and Lebanon in violent conflict, so we looked at these areas again in some articles looking at the mass executions. Some articles even took that further and started talking about the cost, were able to, to ferret that out and were talking about the cost to the economic areas and what that meant in terms of losing manpower and women power and the fact that capital no longer came into the country. We had difficulties in, in many areas after that as well in terms of bringing some of these the um, economic areas to our, er, to our issues. So some of the economic impact, for example, at one time the volume of trade between Iraq and Iran was 13 billion. And so that growth happened a lot when we talk about, I brought up this slide in particular to talk about the ethno-religious areas of this as well. That growth of trade was seen by this Fondieri study in particular as strengthening the relationship between the leaders of these two countries, that because the leaders have so much to do with what happens in that country, they have a great deal of say and power and understanding and ability to be able to negotiate and to do peace building.
it will make a difference then in terms of being able to start looking at those trade agreements again too. So uh, it, it depends on those leaders. That's why I was also finding from the literature in terms of what the economic impact would be uh, of conflict or war. Um, in Kurdistan, of course, this is we, unfortunately, colleagues, we could just turn on the news um, un, again, almost unfortunately every day, and talk about this issue in particular. And I have uh, several slides on this that I won't go over because I'll leave that for you, but it talks about how far historically that this ethno-religious conflict has also dealt with, too and the cost to the country as well. And the differences, again, we had the Syrian Kurds join the, their co-ethnics in the conflict against Iraq and Turkey, and instead of initiating conflict against Syria, that was according to Braithwaite's interpretation as well. So again, the economic impact, and I thought this was one of the most interesting articles I also read, because when maps were used, geographical maps, of what was happening to winter cropland, this was another asset that was taken into consideration, what the impact could be on the economy. So when we talked about um, Iraqi Kurdistan in particular and what was happening after the campaign in 88, there was actually more winter cropland, cropland was classified as active beyond the reconstruction period. So what was said by this author in particular, by Eklund et al., was discussing the fact that more cropland opened up there was more ability to be able to work with individuals in those particular regions to then use the cropland that could not be used before, especially during the campaign and just post the campaign. So this was even a f five years out and longer, they saw greater cropland being able to be used in the, w in the winter for winter crops. So that tells us again that we just need to go further out and in many different areas, even studying the, the uh, topographical and geographical and agricultural maps to determine some of the effects of the war as well. All right. So colleagues, I think I only have about five minutes, Basil. So I'm, please let me know your thoughts on this. Let us know your thoughts. If you were to do some continued research on this area, where do you think, colleagues, we should go with this?